All right, I think we're live. Yes, sir. Recording, recording. What's going on, guys? Welcome to the Ford Thinking Podcast. I'm Luke Jensen. I'm here with my good buddy, Joel. Uh, today, we are going to hit Joel some heavy hitting questions here. We're going to pick his brain. And uh, before we get going, Joel, if you want to just give a little intro on yourself here. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, currently right now, I'm just a, uh, a painter, entrepreneur, coach. <laughs> um, I say that because I own a couple of businesses in the painting world. Um, also have a pest control business and a coaching program. Uh, but fast forward that, you know, biggest thing has been sales, understanding people and doing behavioral coaching. So a little different than usual. Yeah. Yeah. Joel is a, he, he's saying it humbly, man. Joel is a, <laughs> he's a big, big hitter over here. He, so Joel's actually two of our clients. Um, he owns two painting businesses, both of them currently are pushing towards uh, five million dollars in total revenue per year um so he he's got it he got some systems down pat there and uh am i allowed to say what's the kind of next on the cookbook here I, is it yeah absolutely the, yeah okay joel's actually opening yeah. up a third painting business now too uh so <laughs> so there's there's a lot of big momentum coming here in 2024 for you but uh yeah dude both of those painting businesses trending towards five million dollars collectively um one of them's run almost remotely right so you got uh, you got some sick systems there man and i'm i'm excited to pick your brain a little bit so absolutely <laughs> why painting what what kind of got you into the whole painting industry that's a, a great question if we go backwards man this all started in 2011 and i was owning a dojo at the time so um fortunately my wife was working at a chiropractic office and she her I would say her boss ended up bringing in somebody else. So that ended up being my mentor. And you hear chiropractic and painting, you're like, hold on a sec, what's going on? So the reality is, was um, my mentor started mentoring other businesses, but it's off of all the tools he learned from the painting company. So uh, he went to college and going through college was through, I think it was like college works for college pros, those programs where they, recruit college students to run a painting company essentially during the summertime. So he applied all those principles in all his businesses. And right now, I mean, he went from chiropractic offices to HVAC, to painting, to a marketing agency, to you name it. I mean, the guy's pretty much been everywhere and he's been helping people like us that want an opportunity. And it started back in 2011, I was struggling trying to open up an agency myself. I was really big on Facebook marketing and uh, like pretty much growing, yeah, <laughs> growing my audience through Facebook organically. Cause at that time they didn't have Facebook ads yet, but I understood the power of Facebook and I was doing that through my business. I didn't really have marketing dollars. I, I didn't have much knowledge running a business. I was good at sales cause I was running gyms at the time too. But at the end of the day, no one really showed me the back end kind of things. Mm -hmm. So the, the reality is, is that once I found him, my wife introduced us and he started coaching me at that time. So we, we still we're partners here in a business right now in a painting company. And he had told me, he goes, <laughs> he's like, hey, man, there's nothing sexy about painting, but I'm going <laughs> to teach you everything through painting. And I was like, all right, let's do it. So I got into the painting world. Fast forward. I love it. And then yeah. you, that was, when did you start the one in San Diego? In 2018. So he actually wow. started the one in San Diego. I wasn't involved in that yet. My wife was. So she helped create like the office administrative things. Um, he hasn't opened a painting company in about 11 years at that time. So it's been that long since he's kind of started another painting company mm -hmm. and so she kind of started the processes and stuff. And then he hired me to coach his guys. So he was remote and he was like, Hey, Joel, I need someone that I can trust, see the day-to-day -day operations. I really want you to coach the leadership team out there and just talk about management, time management, um, understanding people, customer service. And when I started doing that, he gave me an opportunity and was like, Hey, you know what? Like these guys aren't at the level I need them to be at. So I want you to partner up with me. So then 2019, I just dropped everything and I moved to San Diego, uh, then ended up taking over the business with him. So it's three partners right now, me, 
um, my other partner and him. So um, that's how I got involved. Crazy. And what does your day to day look like over there? Uh, it's changed drastically now, right? Because uh, I have someone working for me in my position. But at the time when I first started, um, I had no painting experience whatsoever. It was just purely managerial. Um, so I had to learn a lot, right? Like I'm going into production as a production manager, doing paint orders, not knowing what paint does what. Mm -hmm. Like I, like you could sit here and tell me, oh, you you need to use an enamel paint. And I'm like, what's enamel? Like I had to rely heavily on my painters and that kind of like played with my mind a little bit. I was like, hey, listen, I can't coach or lead these guys if I don't even know what a tip is or how to properly um, put paint on the wall. So when COVID happened, I actually became a painter. So we downsized our business and I started running my own crew. And for about a year, I got strictly in the painting and that really helped project our business because I truly understood what it took and what my guys were suffering and what they were dealing with on a day to day that most people in managerial side where they're just numbers, that's all they see things. It's just numbers. They don't realize the day to day. So that was a really huge learning experience for me. Yeah. And now how many crews are you currently in uh, San Diego? In San Diego right now, we're at nine crews, but those crews make up about three to four um, people in one crew. Whereas when I first started, I had 12 to 15 crews, but that was two man crews. So it created a lot more stress for me and mm -hmm. um, I had to manage more people. So I downsized the crews to maximize and be more efficient in the company. Gotcha. And then yeah. you launched the second one uh, in Phoenix. You said yep. 14 months now, 14 months ago, 15 months ago now? Yeah, roughly now it'd be about 15 months ago. Yeah. Um, and purely just because my friend came to me and was like, Hey, I'd like to open up a business. He wanted to get into like Jimmy John's. It's like a, a franchise, like sandwich company. <laughs> okay. And I was like, dude, do you know anything about that industry? He's like, no, I'd rather pay them to teach me. And I was like, well, why don't we just partner up and I'll teach you for free? Like I know painting very well. I know this business inside and out right now. I've seen success in it. So why don't you partner with me? And he's like, okay. So I, I created a business out there with zero experienced painters. My whole management team, they've never touched a brush a day in their life, but they're great people. And that's how we created that company. So, and now it's doing really well. <laughs> Where did you find them? Like all the, the people uh, kind of manning, manning the uh, force over there? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, I've actually been mentoring my production manager. So my production manager there, I've been mentoring since the age of 16 years old. He actually was part of my dojo. He was a student there <laughs> and then became a teacher. So we started teaching him how to be a teacher with kids at the age of 16 and, and teaching him leadership skills. And then when I closed the dojo at that time, he went to the next gym and the next business that I worked at. Um, so I went to a car industry and then from the car industry, he followed me to the fitness industry. And then I got him into weight training and personal training. And then, you know, we kind of had a little gap but then he asked me, Hey, I really want to get coached by you. And I was like, well, let's get into painting. So then I hired him. Um, I brought him out here so he can paint a little bit. So he started running his own crew. And then now he's the production manager running three to four crews out there in Arizona right now. Crazy. And in the first 12 yeah. months, first 12 months of operating, you did 1.2 million. 1.2 million. Yeah. With someone who's never but, touched the paintbrush. He, he, he had his eyes locked in on Jimmy John's for some sandwiches. And you said, no, nah, pick yeah. up these paint buckets. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, my philosophy though is uh, great people, right? So, you know, Joey, the reason why I, I mentioned his name on the call right now is because not only is he my best friend and he's my best friend now, right? I'm really big about loyalty and people. So, when we created, here's the thing, when you go backwards, this is what people don't understand of what we do. Um, him and I worked as service writers. I don't know if you know what that means, but as a service writer, we were the guys that you would uh, come to and get your oil changed and we would write up your ticket and then get you taken care of. Or if you're like, hey, I need to get a diagnosis. I have a check engine light on. We're that guy that just took care of customer service. So when I closed the dojo, I started working at this dealership. And from the dealership, I met him. And I was like, man, that's my dude right there. I just recognized right there on the spot. I was like, this guy's from Michigan. I'm from the East Coast. We have the, the same type of personality. I really want to work with this guy closely. Didn't know him for anything, but I spotted him out out of everyone else in the whole organization. And 
I had an opportunity, right? I'm a numbers guy. So I had an opportunity to create a whole new department within the dealership, which we just discussed earlier today, right? Um, and I brought them in and here's two guys, zero experience in what we're doing, but a lot of experience in customer service, a lot of experience in sales. So I coached him throughout those years that we were there and we've got a really tight bond. And then when I came out here and took this pretty much this opportunity, this risk, I like to say, he saw the growth in me and I always promised him, I was like, Hey man, I'm going to get you out of the dealership. I don't know what it is. I don't know when it is, but I promise you, I'll take you with me. And I say that to everyone that's a part of my, my circle. Same thing with Brandon. I promised him he's part of the circle now. So, you know, that's a big deal for me. And uh, the understanding that it's about people, integrity, character, you can mm -hmm. teach skill anytime. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, the <laughs> quotes you told me that kind of hit home was, um, you know, hire for personality and then train the skill kind of situation. And I think that's yes. something that you've just, you've just nailed in, in terms of uh, your development over here, you know? So, uh, and I know Joey and I've, worked closely with joey for last what four or five months now we, we've been working together yeah it's, yeah yeah i say about five months now that's been yeah great. <laughs> so yeah just to, just to kind of give some reference here uh we managed the ads for both the phoenix and the san diego painting companies for joel here um and yeah joey is an awesome guy so hats off hats off to him for being a you know an awesome dude but hats off to you for kind of you know being able to to see that you know when you were you were uh working so closely back in the day yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So right now in San Diego, you have nine crews in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. You got, you said four or five. So how, how are you finding it kind of, cause you're living in Cali right now. Mm -hmm. How are you finding it running, you know, the painting company in Phoenix, um, you know, the seven figure painting company in Phoenix, like versus if you were to do that a little bit more in your backyard, like say like San Jose or Somewhere there's like not too far, kind of out of your area of operation for San Diego, but you know, still pretty close where it's just like a drive away, you know, whereas uh -huh. Phoenix is a little bit further. So how how's that kind of trade off there? Because you're almost running it remote right now, right? Yeah, you know, in the beginning, um, <clears throat> excuse me. In the beginning, I had to inject a lot of energy in there, right? So I was out there once a month, every month, until I felt that my guys were ready. So the, the reality is when you have great people, you don't have to micromanage. You don't have mm -hmm. to be there day to day. They just have to understand their tasks. So earlier we were talking about roles, goals, expectations. You know, what's their role and what is their part of the organization? The problem is a lot of people want to put their hands and fingers in every aspect of a business. It's like, listen, no. If you run production, you worry about production and production only. If you run estimates, you run estimates. That's it. You, wor you worry about your estimates. If you're in the office, you worry about the office. Mm -hmm. Let me handle the business. Let me handle all of these other things. Don't you worry about what other persons are doing in their positions. Because when you have the right people in the right positions and they're 100% focused on that, it allows you to do what you have to do. So, you know, think of me being kind of like the orchestrator, right? Like I, I, I manage, but those processes and systems allow you to really grow your business without you having to physically be there right i don't know if you ever heard of that term so like going through social media when they're like hey a real entrepreneur is when the business runs itself right yeah. not just being <laughs> the one on the day-to-day -day operations like i have systems in that i know my numbers every single day at the end of the day it's called an eod so they send me an end of day stats every single day so i know exactly what's going on so if i see a problem now i'm going to go to my team and be like hey what's the issues i'm seeing that we're not close to goal so I go to the estimator from the estimator. I go to the production manager from the production manager. I go to the office. So my whole leadership team is trained specifically to report to me. And then if there's an issue, I'm available throughout the day, right? Problem solving. And these are the skill sets that a lot of people have a problem with. They can't grow their businesses because they don't share the knowledge that they have. Like I want everyone to outbeat me, outwork me, no more than I do, because if you do, you make in my life easier, right? Mm -hmm. And I want to share one key thing that's important to understand is this. So when you think first things first, your time management needs to be on point when you're going to be remote, because if your time management is not good, there's no way you can run another business remote. It's going to be very difficult, right? Because you're going to always be in urgent mode. Everything's going to be a problem. Everything's going to be urgent. You're going to drop everything you're doing. So. What they say, right, is it's called the Pareto principle. 
don't know if you've heard of that yet. I'm, I'm not sure how far you are in the book, but the seven habits of highly effective people, Stephen Covey talks about the Pareto principle. What that means is 20% of your effort should produce 80% production. And that's the answer to your question, right? I know where the right people are at, the right energy I need to put into those individuals so that they can produce 80% of the results with my 20% effort. And you keep doing that over and over again and they get better and better and better again, the less time they need from me. There's sometimes I don't hear from them all day and I'm like, sweet, must have been a great day. No news is good news <laughs> kind of situation. Yeah. <laughs> so we're finally getting there. In the beginning, not so much, but we're, we're at a point right now that I can scale back. And now my focus is I'm having other problems in San Diego, right? Now we're trying to scale this business even more. So guess what? My energy has been a lot more in San Diego and I'm physically mm -hmm. here. So over in Phoenix, we're good. But if I say, hey, I want to add an extra million dollars in revenue next year, guess what? My energy has to go back there because there's a whole nother skill set they have to learn that they have not acquired. Well, that's what I'm doing this year is teaching them the things that I'm going to project them into the following year so they're prepared for that. Because if not, it, it's just going to take too much of my time and I won't be able to give the value or the attention to any business. Yeah, 100%. And there, there's this, I was on a business retreat uh, this last summer and one of the guys there, he runs a contracting coaching business. Uh, his name's Amher. So he came from, uh, your, your mentor came from College Works. We have up here in Canada, we have something called Student Works. So Amher came from the Student Works organization. Um, so his systems are down pat, like nailed yeah. right um and part of his question is like can you pass the fishing test of like can you actually take a week out of your business you know no phone reception nothing go fish come back and then recognize that your business is still running smooth like if, if you can't have that then it's like you got to start developing your team to take more leadership on so that you can have a business running without you and, and you could be fishing and not have to worry about you know putting fire xyz out you know what i mean I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. That's important to understand. So I so like that you, you shared that. Are, are you are you able to take a fishing test? <laughs> or, or sorry, pass oh, the, the cool fishing part. test? Here's the cool part is uh, I got married last year. Congrats. And thank you. Thank you. And, you know, my wife and I were like, man, should we take this trip? So it was a trip to Europe for 10 days. And you have to remember, my wife runs the office out here. So not only are we taking one person out of the organization, we're taking two people out of the organization. Mm -hmm. So that means two people aren't watching your leadership team. And she not once touched her phone. She not once read an email. Now me, that's just a habit. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. I, I need to know what's going on. I didn't call anyone. I'm just checking, I'm watching, right? Because here's the thing that also people don't understand is that 80% of leadership is follow-up. So I don't care if I'm across the world, best believe I'm still following up, right? Like success to me is a big deal. So, you know, if you choose that you want to be away from your phone, that's, that's for that individual. That's not for me. So I don't want to give you a false answer because I think that's specific to an individual of how they, they operate. I operate at a different level. My level is I, I always know what's going on. <laughs> like, don't get me wrong. I'm going to relax. I'm going to still be present. You know, when we went to Paris, it, it was such a great opportunity to see what our team needs work on and what they don't need work on. And I was really proud of them because really I didn't have to do anything. Um, and it was awesome, right? We have text chains. We have email. I mean, everything, every process you could think about, there's no way to miss something. Yeah. There's always eyes on it, right? So, you know, to answer your question, just because the way I'm built, I, I, I like to know what's going on. But yes, it could run without me. So that told me that we're at a good point right now. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm the same way. Um, for communication for like internally, we choose uh, Slack. It's like a, it's like a discord kind of chat where everything's happening. You know what I mean? Uh, so we have channels for every single one of our clients. And of course I'm in every single one of those channels, you know what I mean? So um, when I'm away or I take a weekend off or whatever, uh, my chat just blows up with like information. So it's hard for me not to like want to check in and see how everything's going. You know what I mean? But it's just one simple click and I'm able to see like what's happening in the business. But, um, you know, I've been, I've been developing leadership teams. So I'm, I'm extremely grateful for that. And, uh, I went through, I went through like, um, 
last month, I think I, I might've told you about it, but uh, it was, it was a little bit of a, a hard, harder, you know, personal standpoint on my end. I kind of went through like a, it was a tough couple, couple, couple weeks, you know? Um, but I noticed at that moment right there, how grateful I was. Cause I was out of commission for like three, four days in the week. You know what I mean? Um, and I was so grateful. Like that's when I recognized like, damn, this business is like fully sustainable now. You know what I mean? Like yes. if anything, me jumping in and out sometimes <laughs> can cause even more issues. They're like, Lucas, come on. They're like, we got this. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing over here? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's good to kind of recognize that. And whether you think you have it or not, putting yourself through that kind of test will be able to tell you. And if anything, you know, it's a test for a reason. You'll be able to grade yourself about like, how close am I to actually being able to have that fishing test where I have this business that can run without me? You know, I'm not saying you take four months off, like, but you know what I mean? You, you, right, you deserve right. a week off here and there, right? So um, that's awesome, man. And you kind of touched on the point of success. So in the eyes of Joel Mercado, what does success look like? <laughs> Ooh, Heavy hitter. Listeners Heavy already. hitter, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. So, you know, I think success is defined by how you grew up. And the reason why I say that is because I went through a lot of phases in my life, right? I went through a solid phase in my life and then I went through a broken phase of my life, right? And I think that's what defines success for me. Like, I don't wanna say that we couldn't afford things. So, you know, out of respect that in my family, um, I had everything I needed, let's put it that way, right? But growing up at some point in my time frame or my age gap of what happened, um, success to find something different. I at a young age, I used to tell my my teachers all the time, I'm gonna be famous one day. And at the time I was a musician, I, I played jazz and um, I was really in the R and B singing and my friends and I had a group and stuff like that. And that's a whole nother story for another day for you. But <laughs> you know, when it comes to success for me, it's a financial freedom, right? So I'm at a point in stage in my life right now that I'm nowhere near my goals, but if, if I needed to step away for a month or two, I can afford it, I'll be fine, nothing's gonna happen. Where I didn't used to live like that, right? It was paycheck to paycheck. So there is financial freedom to me that matters for me for success. And I do understand something, right? Whatever it takes. And a lot of people don't understand that. And for you to see success, I mean, I always tell people in my coaching, success could mean more family time. Mm -hmm right success can be you hit a goal of just learning another language success to me is whatever you define it for yourself right and my goal of success is really to make sure i can guide people to that so that's a successful thing for me too so financial freedom but also giving the knowledge and the guidance for someone else to win that's success to me because that's automatic i win automatically now yeah so yeah i love that i love that yeah I, I agree. I think success is very subjective of like the definition could just be so, you know, just r like ridiculously different for different people, you know, but I, I do agree that I think it does come from uh, your upbringing and everything, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, that's, that's awesome, man. And why Florida? Why, like, why is the next move to open in Florida? Like, how do you, how do you predict or kind of, you know, um, strategize about which state or area or whatever you're opening up next? Like, how do you, how did you kind of deem that and why are you choosing Florida? I like these questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's pretty simple, right? I'm from Pennsylvania and, um, you know, I have a pest control business out there and weather really defines my business. And, you know, it's, it's as much as I want to give back to where I grew up, because I'm from a small town, it's difficult to run a business in, in, in the, in the world that we're in out there. Right. Like I wanted a painting company there. I wanted to give back to where I grew up of my roots and I wanted to open up a painting company, but I was like, man, it snows like five months out of the year. I'm good. Right. Like I, I have a duty for my employees and I have a duty for my partners. So in order for them to be successful, they have to understand that, Hey, I'm in the sunshine States, right? Like Arizona is hot all year round. And in the winter time, yeah, it's cold. You still can paint. I don't have to worry about snow. Rarely have to worry about rain. It's a perfect mm -hmm. place to be at. 
San Diego is like paradise to me. So like, <laughs> yeah, we have rainy seasons, but you know, you could work through rain. Florida, I feel like it's just like San Diego for me, right? So yeah, you're gonna have tropical storms or whatever else, but I mean, those are all temporary states, right? Yeah. Um, but I, I, I choose that because I feel like there's a psychology behind it too. Better weather, better moods, right? And I think that affects businesses and it's important to understand where your demographics are. And when I was coming from the gym industry, location was everything. They, they taught me you have to be the anchor store of a very busy market. And if you're not the anchor store, best believe you better have a really big pocket of marketing so that people know where to find you. Yeah. So if I'm in those regions in this type of business, it makes sense. Now I would give the same advice to someone else if, if it's a different business, right? Like, Snow would be good for snow plowers, right? <laughs> go to a place that if you want to be a guy that snow plows, go where it snows a lot, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Go get based out go of to Alaska. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> you're pumping. <laughs> like, yeah. So I think it's very specific to what your needs are, but I acknowledge that the right place is important. Yeah. That, that would be my answer for you. So if yeah. somebody's in a place that, um, you know, like for example, I'm in Montreal, Montreal, Quebec. Yep. Right. So I could actually expand this and you can kind of see the snow is right behind me. Right. So yeah. um, if somebody is in their hometown and they're like, I want to start a painting business. OK. Would you recommend yeah. them to move to somewhere that's kind of a little bit more year over year operational? Because, I mean, there, there are successful painting businesses here in Montreal, you know, but at some point you're going to have to transition to full interiors. Right. Just yes. because you, you can't do exterior when there's six feet of snow under you. It's, Correct. Not gonna work, you know. Correct. So, would you would you recommend somebody to relocate before doing that, or would you um, would you say it's better to kind of start something a little bit more in your backyard? I think starting something in your backyard because you'll have more support. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've kind of been a lone ranger practically my whole life, even though I have really great people in my circle. But the reality is, I moved from the east coast to the west coast because I was distracted. Um, I wasn't hitting my goals. I was being pulled away from it. So if you're in a good environment and you have an awesome environment, a great support group, I think start in your backyards first and then learn how to run that business first and then go find a different demographic if you're willing to take those risks. And the reason why I say that is because there's nothing better of growth unless you go through pain, right? Mm -hmm. Pain drives change. So, you know, the reality is, is, you know, becoming an entrepreneur is the hardest thing you can ever do. Like, let's be real. Like, <laughs> you're going to work every hour of the day. You're going to put so much time in there. So my advice in the painting world would be this. If, you, if there's a snowy season, learn how to do cabinets, market-specific cabinets, market-specific interiors, understand your audience, understand your market. That way you can be prepared before that happens, right? Um, there's a lot of tools for us, and, and the most important part is find those resources. So I highly recommend Forward Media. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Facebook. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> let's get you guys winning no matter where you're at. <laughs> yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah. So, so the Florida may move, that's kind of purely a climate thing. Like why why not go, you know, more north up in Cali? Um I know Cali has some restrictions especially with deposits and such that you were t telling me about um compared to Phoenix, it's a little bit a little bit uh tighter on on rains yeah. in in some circumstances. Um so why why Florida? Why not you know somewhere a little bit more uh, near your operations? It's a great question. So um, my business partners, right? So that also makes a difference too. My business partners live in Pennsylvania, um, so they wanted to get to a level of success financially, and the only way I can show them is through this business. Mm -hmm. And you know I don't have the autonomy to move someone to be in my market to train them because there's that level of expectation that needs more of my time and that I can't give. Right. So I, 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 I balance certain things out. Right. So I go, okay, what are you guys trying to achieve? And then this is how I can show you just like it was shown to me. Now I can't speak for everybody. I was asked to move to California. I had a home, like my first house that I bought and it was just like this. Hey, Joel, I need you to move in a month. Okay, perfect. We sold our house. We put our moving truck together. We moved. We had no friends here, no family. And we moved together and I, I felt so bad. My poor wife's moving the couch <laughs> off the U-Haul, helping me move into this 750 square foot 
uh, apartment, right? So, you know, acknowledging what people can do, right? And what are they willing to do? So they were willing to go to Florida. Like, I can't ask them to go to Vegas. I really wanted them to go to Nevada. Really? Nevada is even another good spot. Or New Mexico. Those are two areas that I think if you're on the West Coast, we should open a painting company in those areas. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I can't ask them to go to, to Nevada when they have family so close in Pennsylvania. They have family so close in Florida as well. So it was a mix of all those um, understanding, like, where are they at? What's their climate? What's their environment? What skill sets they have? What kind of support do they need? I don't make decisions to make decisions. They're very strategic. So I play chess when it comes to those things. And that's the only way I know I'll be successful. I don't just make a, a quick decision. Um, there's a lot of thought behind it and understanding how that's going to put them in a winning situation. I thought Florida was the best case for them. Love it. Love it. Yeah. So what what's the kind of Florida operation going to look like? Is it going to be pretty similar to uh, Phoenix where you kind of just you're bringing somebody over that's already in your network, you're placing them as the kind of prod manager, and then you're going to have them kind of managing the crews? Or what does that whole situation look like? If you don't mind me yeah. asking, of course, I, I know this is kind of coming up and I don't know what's, you know, what information's out there or not. So if you're, you're comfortable sharing, yeah. let me know. <laughs> Absolutely. I love this. So <clears throat> this is my structure that I learned, right? I opened up Phoenix with $5,000. No one believes me. Five grand. <laughs> that's crazy how do you do that with five thousand dollars and you make it to 1.2 million dollars in gross sales right in 12 months i've yeah. gotten really good of learning how to do a lot of things with nothing because of my back my background my past experiences right you have to go out there and get it so to go back to that question uh the process is the production manager is, is part owner the estimator is the other part owner and they happen to be spouses. Mm. So it's a win-win. It's in the same household. They have an incentive to make more money. They have an incentive to learn from me, right? So I already have the process. I've given them the blueprint, right? I've been coaching them for many years already. So what people don't understand, I didn't just say, hey, I'm going to do this. I've been coaching them <laughs> before even bringing this up to them because I already chose them as partners. Right. Sh I knew I was gonna before you do cut this. down the tree kind of situation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like I already knew that, hey, these are the people I want to bring in on board on this. And I've been preparing for it, right? So that when we launch, here's the cool part, here's the structure. Once we launch, the production manager is actually the foreman on the job. Because remember, I'm trying to teach them this is my money now, right? When when you give people money, they're not learning from that. It's not the same when they have to invest their own money. So here's the thing. I'm giving them the tools. I'm giving them the blueprint. They're doing the sweat equity while I'm supporting them, paying for the marketing, supporting them, putting the LLC together, supporting them, whatever financial deeds that needed to happen. This is a different case now that we've grown so much, right? It's going to be a little more than $5,000 this time. <laughs> yeah. I don't want that stressing because it was stressful. I'll tell you that. For sure. So, you know, I think this investment, we're probably about 25,000, which still to me is very low. The ideal investment for a painting company should be around 150 K. Um, and I'm doing 25 because I already know what I did with five. So what am I going to do with 25 and the structure to that now understand, which is really cool is the production manager is learning production while painting and running their own crew. So they're going to produce $7,500 a week. Well, guess what? That $7,500 a week, her, she's a production manager. Her pay is included in that production. So it costs me $0 hmm. when you really think about it. Because what people go is like, oh, I'm going to put this manager in position and they're not ready yet. So that's an extra expense that they're not producing for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Really, the expense to me is the estimator because I have to put them on a salary, right? I have to build them up. They have to start building up the schedule. They need to go out there and sell. But the production manager, the rule of thumb in my business is they run their own crew while they're managing the company. So they still do payroll. They still do their paying orders. They still do all that stuff that they would as a production manager, but they're actually physically painting. Then the second crew comes in. Once we go from 7,500 to 15,000 per week, they hire their second crew. They're still working in their first crew. 
while managing the second crew. Once they get to three crews, which is 22.5, right? Now the 22,500 production is their goal to stop painting and they hire a foreman to take over their crew that they were working with. Now we're at a point right now, I can afford their, their salary, which isn't a problem anymore because they've been paying for themselves for however long that took. And the business succeeds, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people want to just start spending money. I try to find ways to save money, but also grow the business in a healthy manner. And that's been my recipe and how I did it in Phoenix. Interesting. And what, what are kind of some of your biggest lessons that you learned in Phoenix that are now going to be, you know, um, solved or pre-solved kind of going into Florida? Like what are some, some flags that kind of, you know, caught your eye that you're like, okay, now this time I got to fix this. Yeah. So it kind of goes against my philosophy, which is kind of funny. Um, you know, I always say I, I hire off integrity and character and then I teach skill, right? Um, the number one thing I think is important, I think the estimator needs to know how to paint. And the reason why I say that is we see things differently when we paint and understand a process differently than learning the estimating side of it. We mm -hmm. could teach you everything you want about estimating and about painting and product knowledge, but until you physically do it, it really changes your world. So what I'm doing this time in Florida is the estimator and the production manager are going to be painting and they're going to understand Hey, when I promise a customer, hey, I, you should include this, look how much extra time that took and how much the company lost because you didn't provide that detail in the estimate because you didn't understand how long it takes to literally paint cabinets or to paint a door, what the process looks like, how to prep it properly. And when they start to acquire that, they start speaking like a painter. And I feel like that brings so much more value to the customer because then they're gonna know what our process really does look like. Mm -hmm. And I think that experience really will make a difference for me in Florida, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think the more information that your sales rep has or the estimator has, um, the better they're gonna be able to kind of persuade that value to the customer and the more information they're gonna be able to give because now they'll be able to spot things out that they wouldn't have been able to, you know, if they weren't a painter, right? Like 100%. My, my, my sales rep, um, he sits in on all our internal meetings uh, where we review every friggin' single ad account, you know what I mean? So props to Sam for, for tuning in because coming in and just kind of getting that dropped on your lap, you know what I mean? It's a lot of information. But now when he yeah. shows up on the sales calls, um, he's able to kind of provide that info and look at people's ads library and notice like, okay, you're running this. Why are you doing this? This is what we've seen work. You know what I mean? And kind of provide that information yes. and then sell the implementation, right? So it's a... Uh, having your your sales side fully informed on like a lot of the processes and structures is definitely going to be a game changer so i love that you're doing that yeah thank you thank you yeah <laughs> learn from your mistakes right <laughs> that's it man all lessons man all lessons so mm -hmm. what's uh what's the target revenue with the the florida we don't have to say the, the area in florida um but yeah. we, we've we've crossed all that off for our ads because you know we're gonna we want to work with you so <laughs> we're yeah, yeah. turning down all the clients because we got Joel coming in in a, uh, maybe a yeah, year or so. I already but. hired you too. I'm, I'm ready. I'm like, let's, I already put you <laughs> in my budget. So here's the cool part, right? Um, in six months, I want them to project a million dollars in revenue. A million is the first thing. Like if you can't hit a million, you can't work with me. Like I, I've learned that really fast. That, that once they hit a million, there's a different understanding when it comes to business. And then we start working from there, right? So, of course, the first full calendar year, it's going to be a million. We're going to make that happen. But we're starting it. I'm a, I'm a, I like to start in January. Our circumstances this year, we just didn't feel ready for it. But I also don't like to wait. So I, I'm one that pushes hard. Uh, so we agreed June, July, we're going to open no matter what happens. Uh, so obviously, my calendar year is only giving me six months. But if I can get them to project towards a million dollars, I'm doing my job right and they're well equipped to do that so um once they get a million dollars that's the first thing and just to give a structure as a partnership with me that i've learned is i need to get my partners to understand how to make two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year as take home for them <laughs> once they achieve that i know i got them to at least the 10 percent of the world right and the reason why i say that is because that changes your life <laughs> like someone makes 250 grand a year it, it's going to change their life. 
Yeah. Right. And that's what I need to teach these guys to understand. So those are my metrics. My metric is show you how to do gross sales and a million dollars in your business. And then the next metric is how do I show you to make 250 K a year as an owner? Um, so that's, those are my two major metrics to give you an idea of what, what I push for. Love that, man. I love that. Yeah. Now I've got three <laughs> final questions for you and you can speed run these. Right. Or you can take time and answer them. It's up to you. Okay. Okay. Number one, Somebody who's running a painting business now, who's currently not at a million dollars, what are some specific action items that you'd recommend for them in order to get to that million dollars for 2024? First things first, budget. What's your budget for marketing, right? It, and then you have to be so specific, like how much is a million dollars in gross sales? If they don't know those numbers, you, you, you got to get them to see it, visualize it, right? Mm -hmm. Be so specific because as you've seen on our coaching calls before, when I ask painters, they're like, yeah, I want to make between. There's no between. <laughs> it's this or that. It's that simple because the business doesn't know what you're trying to strive for, right? Once you make those goals, I always tell everybody this real quick. Once I make a goal, the business doesn't know if it's me selling it, you selling it, someone else is selling it who's painting it it just knows it needs to do what it needs to do to survive so once i set those goals we're not going to veer from that and we're yeah. going to drive towards those goals period yeah. right so uh, you know the biggest thing is i always ask those painters i go hey listen guys be specific understand break down a billion dollars in gross sales and then at least have a minimum of 10 percent budget towards those markets <laughs> so you have to have a hundred thousand dollars a month or a year right towards those gross sales, right? If it's 10%, it's $100,000 in marketing. If you don't have $100,000, let's figure that out, how to get to that number, yeah, right? And break that down and start moving away your profits, right? Yes, I know your profit goal might be 50%, but guess what? Take some of that profit goal, put it into your marketing. People misunderstand how powerful marketing is, especially in our world. I come from an industry, we call it EFT, electronic funds transferred. This isn't ideal for me. I prefer membership-based businesses because those that's guaranteed money for me no matter what. Mm -hmm. But in the painting world, you're constantly looking for a new customer, new customer, new customer, new customer. So that's how I would break them down to understand that if you don't have that ad spend, how do we get there? Why it's important? And don't ever veer away from that ad spend. You need it. There's no yeah. way around it. So if someone's got that million dollar goal, right? And they're starting right yep. now. So we got the full 12 months basically. That's $83,000 a month broken down. You need at least $8,300 a month in marketing spend to hit that. What's 100%. your, I know, I know you're, you're a big adamant of, um, you know, not splitting the difference and that I totally agree. And I, I do hear that all the time of like, oh, you know, maybe 850,000 or a million, you know what I mean? You're just like, why, why are you splitting the difference? You know what I mean? Yeah, I was listening yeah. to a, a, a podcast with Lex, Fried, uh, Lex Friedman and Jeff Bezos. And he was saying, when you're comparing, you should never, ever split the difference. If like, I'm saying my ceiling is 10 feet and you're saying 12 feet, we're not going to just compromise, meet in the middle and say, like, okay, it's 11. It's like, no, you're going to take your, your measuring stick and you're going to measure and then figure it out. You know what I mean? And you got to be yes. specific about it. You're not going to split the difference based on, you know, high projections and then worst case scenario. It's like, no, dude, you got to dial that in. So yeah, I love that. Dude. Be specific with the budget. Yeah. Can I add something to that real fast? Yeah, please do. What, what, what you just said right there, I just had this talk about this uh, yesterday, actually, with my team. Um, we were talking about collection goals, and we have a $13,000 check that's coming from a commercial job from like four weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I told them, I was like, that does not go towards your collection goal. It's important to understand your goals are still your goals. That $13,000 check, look at that as a bonus. Because if my estimator puts in his mind, that's $13,000 less that I need to book, that I need to collect, he will automatically perform at a lesser value, which will then hurt my team, which means that now he's not booking at the rate that he's supposed to book, which means he's not booking us in advance, which means he's kind of letting off the gas, right? So just like you said, it's not 10 to 12. Should we meet in the middle of 11? No, that check does not exist, right? Like we have other expenses we have to deal with. Let that go to that stuff. 
your goal is your goal. That's new revenue. I want you guys to focus on. Mm -hmm. So that paradigm shift I gave my team just drove them. They're like, all right, got it, boss. Because like you said, now you're going to problem solve to get to the goal. But if I gave him that $13,000 check, guess what? There's no problem solving. He's going to fall back. He's still going to miss goal because he's relying on this $13,000 check. And then it hurts the business on the opposite end. Hundred. So that's how I drive my team. You, you, you can't let it be like that. So I just wanted to share that because that's a very specific thing that I'm really big about that a lot of just, I say average individuals, because that's the average mentality. We go to that and like, oh, that's comfort. No, yeah. I'm going to push you past your comfort zone. It's you got to understand that. <laughs> I, love it. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, man. So budget being specific, that's kind of the main thing. So kind of have the yes. end goal in mind and then break that down to smaller chunks until you're able to make it. Absolutely. Love it, man. Love it. Number two. <laughs> All right. So number one was how, how can someone grow a million dollar business this year or penny business or any business really. Right. But, um, number two, this is, this is a big one. Okay. Okay. Top three books that you've read. <laughs> Man, I love books. Number one, seven habits of highly effective people. Number two, Five Levels of Leadership, mm. John C. Maxwell. Number three, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, John C. Maxwell again. Those are my top three right now. <laughs> well, and I, I'm a man of God, so technically number one is the Bible. But if it's going to a regular book, those are my top three books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're all people-based, all leadership people-based. 100%. Interesting. I love that. I love that. Would you, would you, this is kind of like, I know I said three questions. This one's like a little spin off here. Um, would yeah. you dedicate a lot or would you, I guess, assign a lot of your success towards self development, i.e., reading, courses, coaching, et cetera? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I don't share this often, but I like to share this on your platform right now. I think it's imperative that people understand coaches need coaches. Yeah. Right. And coaches have coaches. So don't be deceived. You know, like a lot of people are like, oh, man, you got this, you got that. I got so many coaches, it's ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. I got a fitness coach that watches my food habits, my eating habits. I hired him because I'm horrible at it. So I know where my weaknesses are. And I find the people that are strong in that to hold me accountable so I could be the best version of myself. Second thing is, is uh, I see a hypnotherapist that does uh, neuro-linguistic programming, you know, Growing up in the past of abuse, verbally, physically, and other things that's happened in my life, in my past, you have triggers. Everybody has triggers. Everybody has traumas. So I pride myself in understanding why I act the way I act, why I react the way I react, why I get upset when I get upset, why I get happy when I get happy, understanding the psychology. So I seen her once a month for five years straight when I made that decision to be the best self. Um, the books... I feel like those are mentors in themselves, right? They all say the same thing. Many people don't realize that. But when it comes to personal development, it's the same thing. They just say it differently because it needs to connect in different stories, different situations for everybody. Right. So I think that's important to understand. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think as, as when you read a book, you're going to you know, highlight some stuff, pick things out from that. And then if you reread it, you'll notice that you pick out even more. You know what I mean? So it's not uh, – yeah. I'm sure, like, I guarantee you haven't read seven habits, you know, just one time, like that's probably a book that you're consistently referring to and then you're getting more yeah. info and more gems from it. You know what I mean? So yeah, I love that dude. Every time. Yeah. Every time. Yeah. So the, that's a good three right there. That's a good three. Um, good. I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. No problem, man. Yeah. Uh, last question here. This is the, this is the, the, the bell of the ball. All right. All right. Besides starting, you know, uh, the, the painting company in Florida in, in June or July, um, what can we expect out of Joel Mercado in 2024 here? <laughs> um, I'm really working in the, the, the personal development space, you know. Um, I truly believe that leaders that are positioned to be leaders have been led the wrong way. And the reason why I say that is, you know, 
I've been around a lot of jobs that people get positions based off of their personal performance, but they're horrible leaders. Mm -hmm. Like think about that, right? Like they can lead themselves because they know what works for them and how they tick and what they can do, but they're horrible at leading others because they don't have tools to reteach, right? Like we all know a lot of the things that everyone talks about, but how do you put it in your mind to reteach it? That's important, right? So there's a lot of things that I talk about and, and I'm saying this probably for the first time ever on a podcast or even online. I want to write a book and I'm, I've been writing notes on it and it's called the universal, the universal language. And the reason why I'm calling it the universal language is because just like today, I say we speak English. We all speak the same language, but we don't understand each other. Right. And it's understanding behavior. So what you're going to see in 2024 is a, I've been saying it a lot online is that I'm going to push so much positivity. I'm going to push so many tools so that you guys understand on how to change your habits, right? Because we all have core issues. We all have traumas and it's my life work. And this 2024 for me is going to be something big that I'm going to start speaking more. I'm going to be at more speaking engagements, um, more podcasts, more networking. I want people to understand that there's something that I know that a lot of people do too, right? But I want them to understand my passion and how I'm going to help them. Because at the end of the day, I feel like I was put on earth to help people understand and help them get past through their pains. Whether it's business, personal, whatever it is, I have a heavy heart for that. So 24, you're going to see me a lot. That's for sure. I've been under a rock because I was learning a lot of things. Um, I wanted to be a perfectionist at it and so that I can have answers for a lot of people. And uh, yeah, you guys are going to be seeing a whole lot of me this year for sure. Dude, I hope so, man. You got a lot of value to bring, <laughs> you know, even, even today on, on the coaching call with our clients, we had people that jumped in for the first time. And they're like, dude, this was the best coaching call I've ever been to. And I've been to a lot, you know what I mean? So yeah. just that, it's just yeah. like, man, that's why I want you on this podcast, brother. Cause you got so much <laughs> value and I just want to pick, pick pieces out of there. You know what I mean? You got, you got a ton yeah. of knowledge and uh, you've done incredible things so far, dude. So. I'm excited to see what 2024 is going to look like for you, man. Hey, man, I appreciate you, man. That means a lot to me. <laughs> Definitely, Joel. Cool. Awesome, brother. So uh, thanks again for you know hopping on the pod here, man. I'm excited to uh, get this launched out. But uh, if people want to get into contact with you, they could do so how? Yeah, you know, I'm really big on Instagram. And the reason why is, you know, DM me, follow me. Um, I believe it's Joel Bricado official. <laughs> so just look me up. If not, you can find me through Lucas. If you're following him, you'll follow me. Um, the biggest thing, the reason why I like that is because on Instagram, I'm constantly giving free tools, free tips on content. And um, I think that's the best way that you can take a little bit of pieces and then hop on some coaching calls and then put this all together based off what you see on my stories and what you see on my content. So that's the best way to get a hold of me. Love it, man. And I'll drop the link here just in case anybody has any uh, questions and wants to reach out to you. But uh, man, thanks for thanks for all the value, dude. Grateful to have you on the on the show here today and uh, looking forward to to seeing what you can do, brother. Let's go, man. Appreciate right, man. you. Crush it. All right.